After Mussolini's failed attempt to invade Greece in the winter of 1940, the Germans rolled into the country in the April of 1941. In despair, the Greek Prime Minister shot himself, and the people began to panic, buying up all the food and besieging banks in order to withdraw their savings. Food supplies began to dwindle even before the Germans had taken over. Eggs became a luxury and prices began to soar. But when the hungry German troops did arrive, looking half-starved according to some witnesses, they began to steal food from the local populace and looted houses, restaurants and businesses. These noble Teutonic knights even stole bedsheets and metal doorknobs from poor houses. However, alongside plundering by individual soldiers, supply officers were requisitioning much larger quantities of goods. 25,000 oranges, 4,500 lemons and 100,000 cigarettes were shipped off kiosks within three weeks of occupation. Firms like Krupps and IG Farben sent experts in Wehrmacht uniform to Greece in order to secure the resources of the country. The entire output of Greek mines, including iron ore, chrome, nickel and gold, was expropriated and now supplied the Third Reich. The shipbuilding works, textile plants, munition works and electricity plants were nationalised. According to estimates from the Wehrmacht's economic staff in Greece, plundering wiped out some 40% of real Greek income in 1941. A year later, occupation costs and state expenditures accounted for around 90% of real gross domestic income. Greek tobacco was an important morale and economic boost for the Reich, and 270,000 tons had been sent to Germany, and another 600,000 tons had been acquired by the spring of 1942. The total amount dramatically exceeded the annual demands of German smokers and promised to yield almost 2.5 billion Reichsmarks in tobacco taxes for the Reich Treasury. Other major import products included chromium and other metallic ores, olive oil, currants and silk for the production of parachutes. Transport was organised by the Schenker Company, which enjoyed a monopoly in Greece. Schenker's representative in Salonika also served as a spy in the security service. When the country was split into different Axis zones of occupation, the Italians complained that the Germans had already secured all of Greece's resources. Having upset their ally, and not wanting to sour relations even further, the Germans decided to share the spoils a little more. But only a bit. Either way, Greece was being plundered of property, resources and goods and services, to the point that the country was instantly thrown into economic disaster. Factories and businesses closed because of a lack of raw materials, or because their equipment and stocks had been expropriated and sent off to Germany. Price controls were implemented, causing shops and businesses to close. This all resulted in mass unemployment for both parents and children, since the children had worked in the factories as well. Things were made worse by the fact that the Germans had outlawed trade between islands, outlawed fishing, and had attempted to steal boats, causing fishermen to deliberately sabotage their own vessels. Estimates say that around 50% of Athens' population was now out of work. And the Axis occupiers split the country into isolated local administrative units, setting up roadblocks and requisitioning food and pack animals for the troops. Bribes were needed to pass through the checkpoints, and farmers were hesitant to risk bringing their food to market, or couldn't because their animals had been taken from them and they had nothing to pull their carts. In addition, the disruption to the farming sector meant that the harvest for 1941 was between 15 and 30% lower than it had been before the war. And when the authorities went to buy the food off the farmers as part of a new centrally planned food distribution system, they offered prices that were too low, so the farmers refused. When they went to steal the food off the uncooperative farmers instead, they found themselves looking down the barrel of a gun. The overall result was that the government managed to collect barely one quarter of its grain target. A portion of the food they did get was shipped back to the Reich because the Germans needed the food for themselves because they were also in a food crisis, as I've detailed in previous videos. Thus, the Germans were still taking food from Greece at a time when the Greek people didn't have enough to subsist. 
This policy can only be viewed as disastrous when you realize that Greece had been an importer of food before the war. The Germans have taken from the Greeks even their shoelaces, and now they pretend to place the blame for the economic situation on our shoulders. Considering that Mussolini was the reason the Axis were in Greece in the first place, he should rightly be blamed for the situation, but his assessment is true. It was the Reich's food policy that saw the Greeks starve. In all the occupied territories, I see the people living there stuffed full of food, while our own people are going hungry. For God's sake, you haven't been sent there to work for the well-being of the peoples entrusted to you, but to get hold of as much as you can so that the German people can live. I expect you to devote your energies to that. This continual concern for the aliens must come to an end once and for all. I could not care less when you say that the people under your administration are dying of hunger. Let them perish so long as no German starves. So Greece had become a patchwork of isolated regions, some with a surplus of food, others without. A week after the occupation had begun, as looting and inflation destroyed them, shopkeepers withdrew their goods from sale and people began to hoard. Urban areas suffered the worst, as queues of hundreds of people could be seen outside the few remaining open shops. Some people even brought chairs to sit on them as they waited. The transportation system also broke down for both food and people. The few vehicles that were still in operation were packed, but the fuel shortage was so severe that eventually all services ceased. It is a disheartening reality, but reality nonetheless, that these four years of war eradicated our public transportation system by 100%. The existing railroad became no more than a wreck. Large and small bridges, faculties, buildings, factories, machine facilities, railroad stations, everything, everything is completely destroyed. Vehicles, supplies, steam engines, passenger and cargo carriers, all that have come by the sweat of our brow, all that have been paid for by the Greek people in its 120 years as a modern free nation today no longer exists. Not that citizens could go anywhere anyway, since they needed permits to travel, which took several days to get in the bureaucratic nightmare of Axis Greece. By autumn, even the wealthy were fearing the worst. I predict a tragic winter for the poor and the children in the towns. The result can be seen plainly in the bread ration for Athens, which started at 300 grams per person per day, but fell to 200 grams by the end of June, and then 100 grams by November. However, even though they'd watered down the bread, reducing its quality, they only had enough in November for three weeks worth of rations. And there were days or even longer where no bread was distributed at all. By the autumn, meat had disappeared, and the ironically named Ministry of Supply could only hand out olive oil and sugar, topped up by a few currants. In Athens, the government was only able to provide rations of 458 calories per person, not even half of what most people need to maintain the body's normal functions. In November, this fell to a paltry 183 calories, equivalent to one or two slices of bread per day. Bearing in mind that the Germans at Stalingrad got around six times that amount at the worst point in the siege. It's no wonder that the Greeks put all their belongings in the street and sold them in an attempt to make more money. White-collar workers and cashiers took to working as porters to earn more. Others begged. Soup kitchens were set up by private initiatives, but could only feed people two or three times a week. And people became so frail with hunger that soon they couldn't make the journey to the soup kitchen in the first place. People resorted to eating grass, weeds and wild plants. Women went without food to save extra for their children, as those children searched through rubbish bins for scraps of food. Beggars broke into the basements of suburban houses or dug up vegetable gardens at night in search for food. Old women were attacked and robbed in broad daylight in the suburbs of Athens. 
One woman collapsed in the street, leaving her children to cry. Another lady had sold all her possessions and now lay in her doorway covered in a blanket, unable to help her three children who were crying inside, sat near the body of their father who had died several days before. Parents tended to feed the children, then die, leaving the children on their own. Males also tended to die first, which created thousands of widows and orphans. Some German officers tormented urchins by throwing them scraps from balconies and watching them fight amongst themselves. Soldiers eating olives in the streets attracted a crowd of children. As soon as one spat out an olive stone, the children rushed for it. The fastest would put it in his mouth and suck it clean. People left corpses in public cemeteries at night so that they could hold on to their ration cards. Others buried them in unofficial graves, again so they could keep their ration cards. Mass burials became a thing, but when grave diggers became too weak to dig, the state had to provide them with extra rations. Even those in prosperous parts of Athens went cold and hungry. And this was just in Athens. Across the whole Greek population, only 4% were meeting their calorie intake, and the rest were malnourished. The reports state that in the mountainous regions, the children were famished and exhausted, living a borderline existence, emaciated and unable not only to move, but even to speak. On the island of Ikaria, the main diet came from imports, and a third of their food came from fishing. But the Axis had outlawed fishing, and had restricted imports from elsewhere, leaving the islanders to subsist on a few vegetables and grapes. On the island of Xeros, the Italians had flooded the local market with currency to buy all the food and clothing from the locals, pricing out the poor and causing shortages. Then the Italians put a ban on exports, although softened this to allow trade to the mainland, if they could balance exports with imports, which was impossible because the fixed price system on the island was lower than the inflated prices on the mainland. So trade ground to a halt. Without the import of raw materials, industries on Syros closed down, and shopkeepers had nothing to sell and so shut up shop, even though the authorities ordered them to remain open. Daily fishing was allowed, but the traditional method of night fishing was only permitted without lamps and within two miles of land. All fish had to be brought back to Syros, and no transfers to other ships were allowed, with fines for non-compliance. The head of the fleet was responsible for the collective sale of fish at fixed prices and the distribution of the proceeds. Most crucially, private market stalls and bargaining was banned. Every man had to have a permit which was checked by the military command. Because of the weak physical state of the fishermen, they received an extra ration of bread and small quantities of beans. The occupiers claimed that their intervention had considerably improved fishing, but the fishermen's lot was worse during the occupation due to artificially low prices. The fact that it was necessary to supplement the men's diet with extra rations to keep them alive and at work indicates how poorly nourished they were. Surveillance was so severe that it was rare that the fishermen managed to bring fish home. Indeed, the poorer working families in Syros ate little or no fish throughout the occupation. Many fishermen died during the famine, and it was significant that, in spite of high unemployment, locals were unwilling to take on their jobs. The local Italian commander, Colonel Duca, reported to his superiors that there was nothing left on the island except for onions, which is backed up by other accounts. Throughout August, one local, Mario Ruguzzo, reported that his family had gone 25 days without eating anything but a few onions. There was no bread until the end of August, and butter and meat had disappeared. There were a few cigarettes, but they couldn't eat them. Interestingly, it appears that the Italian authorities were surprised that the economy of Xeros had collapsed, and even had the nerve to warn the locals that it wasn't healthy to live on a diet of onions alone. Italian doctor Captain Manfrini wasn't convinced by the first deaths, and didn't believe the rumours that people were dying of starvation. When he realised that it wasn't a ruse, and that people were genuinely starving, he tried to talk to his superiors, but nobody would take him seriously. 
I observed with my own eyes the haggard, anguished and yellow faces of the majority of the population, a state that was not yet obvious before I left, and which now affected not just the poorer people, but was common among the rich, proof that the food deficit was now critical even for those with the means to buy it. Colonel Duca finally reacted and started asking around for food, but despite trying to negotiate with other administrations like Crete and the Ionian Islands and offering cloth in exchange, he either got no response or negotiations broke down. Only a quarter of the allocated quota of olive oil from Crete arrived at all, and a small amount of raisins and figs. The Italians therefore introduced regulations in order to solve the crisis, even though it was regulations that got them into the mess in the first place. They ordered households to report how much food they had, and restricted how much food they could save in order to combat hoarding. They then proceeded to steal all the food, regardless of whether it was within the quota or not. They also resorted to inspecting food producers and forced them to sell to the authorities. But, after protests from the food producers, the Italians gave in, and in May 1942 allowed a Greek syndicate to pool the food themselves and sell at fixed prices. This later failed at the end of July. So, with the food situation unsolved and rapidly deteriorating, this telegram was sent from Syros to Athens. Either send us wheat or coffins. The Italians had realised that they needed to sort out the problem, and so made efforts to import food. But it was too late. The island's official death toll rose from 435 in 1939 to 2,290 in 1942. Some put the figure as high as 4,000, and a few even 8,000, although that is certainly too high. Bearing in mind that the island's population was about 17,000, even 2,290 is a massive amount. There were perhaps 4,000 deaths for the entire war, with around 2,300 for the first winter, although accurate numbers are probably impossible to calculate. Poor diets led to disease and illness, and the cold winter also killed a lot of people. So there's no way to tell exactly how many people specifically died of starvation or of other causes. I vow, in the memory of the dead children of my generation, to tell nothing but the truth of what I have experienced myself during the occupation of Xeros. Children aged 8 to 12, wearing nothing but rags full of lice and fleas, were slowly dying in dark and cold houses where there was no food, no candlelight, no clean clothes as before. Admiral Inigo Campioni Governor of the Aegean, visited the island in the May of 1942. Some prominent Greeks were allowed to attend the party in the Admiral's honour. But when the buffet was revealed, the Greeks charged it and devoured whatever they could stuff into their mouths, refusing to move away from the table. I have seen nothing up till now since the occupation of Greece by the Axis powers which could make me accept that this new order of things will be something just, moral and human. On the contrary, in everything that these renewers of humanity have done, one sees injustice, immorality and inhumanity, thieving, the plundering of every living thing by the invaders in order to make the population die of hunger, administrative injustice, terror and police brutality daily. On the island of Sifnos, the 120-man garrison of Italians controlled the entire olive oil business. They allowed the farmers to keep a certain ration, then expropriated, i.e. took or taxed, the remaining harvest off them. Then they gave it to the local merchant, who sold it back to the locals at six times the official price, and then split the profits with the Italians. Since the state had failed to meet the needs of the Greek people, an unofficial market sprang into being. In fact, one group of economists said that the official market basically didn't even exist, and that the people were fed only on the unofficial market. When the officials, civil servants, ministers, priests, and more, all abused their power to help themselves, such as diverting Red Cross relief to his friends in the case of the Bishop of Mytilene, the unofficial market offered relief. Both rich and poor knew that the only place to get soap, meat or thread was from people who dealt on the unofficial market. 
Of course, the starving people hated the farmers and the marketeers, falsely blaming them for the famine and falsely blaming them for the high prices, which were caused by the Axis state authorities. But the farmers and merchants had a difficult job. They had to hide crops from the Axis tax collectors, bribe their way through numerous checkpoints, charter ships and sail them through hostile seas full of Axis and Allied ships, submarines and planes, pay off harbour masters, pay off Germans, Italians and translators. One Greek free marketeer started his career after being arrested by the Germans for fishing without permission, and had to bribe his way out of jail. His boats were burnt by the Germans after they burnt down the village they were in, so he began shipping Jews to the Middle East in exchange for money and smuggling people in and out of Greece for the British. Back on the island of Xeros, import and export permits became the unofficial currency and were passed back and forth as a means of exchange. Not that permits were always needed. As to the question of inter-island contraband and with the mainland, mainly carried out with rowing boats or small fishing boats, really effective repression action could only be effective when every island command, especially that of Syros, has a fast motorised vessel for the use of the customs police. Such action is only possible at the moment round a few of the smaller islands. And if you think fake news is a modern phenomenon, think again. Journalists in Volos said that the sudden local crime wave had nothing to do with the hunger, even though the targets for the thieves were restaurants, food factories and food warehouses. The Axis Greek government of 1941-1942 to was headed by Georgios Dezakoglu, widely hated by everyone. In addition to requisition commodities, the Axis had demanded occupation costs from the Greek government. And since the normal methods of taxation couldn't possibly work, the Greek state was forced to print currency. In June 1941, there were 24 million drachmas in circulation. In 1942, there were 109.8 million. And the official price of bread went from 70 drachmas to 2,350 in that time. So, with the currency becoming completely worthless, people resorted to barter, or using physical goods as a measure of value. Cigarettes were used as currency, or olive oil, or wheat, or gold, if some was available. Once the Red Cross started distributing quinine tablets in the malarial areas of central Greece, these too started circulating as currency. And yes, the Red Cross became involved in the Greek relief effort because the British and the United States, amongst others, decided to help Greece out, even though the British blockade was in effect. The Axis said that it was the British blockade that was causing the famine, even though they were the ones occupying the country and had gone to war in the first place, prompting the British blockade. And instead of the Axis doing something to help the Greeks, on the 16th of February 1942, it was the British government that finally decided to break the blockade in order to send food ships to Greece, although the first ship didn't arrive until August 1942. In contrast to the pre-war period, imports were reduced to 6%, and it was only when the Allies decided to break the embargo on the second year of Axis occupation that it rose to 10%, and in the third year to 12% of pre-war era, mostly because of the provision of food by the Allies. Interestingly, it was about that time that the Axis changed their minds too. Despite the fact that Mussolini sent Hitler a message telling him how bad the situation was in Greece, Hitler himself refused to reduce the reparations on Greece, as did others in his government. It was only in late 1942 that the situation demanded change, and the only reason for that change was because the Germans now feared total economic collapse in Greece, which would undermine their ability to occupy the country. German soldiers were now complaining that their own purchasing power had evaporated due to the destruction of the drachma, and many were forced to participate in the black market, which they should have been trying to stop. 
In this case, it was Hitler himself who had finally decided to take action, fearing an Allied invasion of Greece, and realising that most of the Greek population, 95% according to one Wehrmacht report, was now hostile to the Axis. It was also obvious now that if the currency collapsed, this would prevent the Axis from extracting goods and services from the Greek economy. So it was Hitler's deputy for Southeastern Europe, Hermann Naubacher, that was given authority over the economic and financial situation in Greece on the 5th of October 1942. Naubacher became Reich Special Plenipotentiary for Economic and Financial Questions in Greece. Naubacher himself, though, had interests in IG Farben and had been their Balkan expert before the war. He had also led the German Economic Commission for Romania and Bulgaria, sorting out the German-created financial crisis in both those countries. Now, with Mussolini's economic emissary, de Agostino, Naubacher went to solve Greece's economic plight. His first action was to suspend food exports, bring in food imports, halt occupation costs temporarily, and reduce purchases by Axis troops of goods in Greece. He also lifted price controls to allow prices to move to their natural free market value. He decreed that all able-bodied Greeks had to work, which would boost production, and he got rid of the Greek Prime Minister. But these measures would only offer a temporary respite. What was needed to combat price increases was to stop inflation, the printing of the currency supply. In order to do that, they would need hard money. Gold. So the plan was simple. And evil. Gold and other physical assets would be collected from the Greek Jews, sold on the market for drachmas, then this money would be given to the German troops in Greece, who could then purchase food and goods from the Greeks, and thus cover their occupation costs without costing the Reich a penny. So, on the 17th of October 1942, the Jewish community was given the opportunity to free their able-bodied men from forced labour under organisation tort. If the community handed over 10,000 gold pounds to the Germans, which they did. More demands of gold were ordered in November, and... In total, the Wehrmacht squeezed 25,000 gold pounds from Jews in Salonika to meet its operating costs for November and December 1942. Then, on the 1st of March 1943, Jewish families in and around Salonika were ordered to declare their assets. The Germans tortured some of them to confess where they had hidden their jewellery and money. On the 15th, the 45,984 Jews in the area were deported to Auschwitz. Their property was given to the state, and either given to refugees in turn, or sold to the market for drachmas. The Jewish cemetery in Salonika was auctioned off and converted into real estate. It has been estimated that the stolen Jewish property amounted to 1.7 million gold pounds. The occupation costs for the Wehrmacht in Greece was around 3 million gold pounds. And, since the Bank of Greece's figures show that it had handed over 1.26 million gold pounds to the Germans, this then left a shortfall of 1.74 million gold pounds, which is almost exactly the figure stolen from the Jews. So it was that between October 1942 and September 1943, the German occupiers, assisted by the Greek finance minister, the Bank of Greece and various trusted brokers, propped up the drachma using gold that they had plundered from the Jews of Salonika. In doing so, they directly financed the German Wehrmacht. The overall result was the stabilisation of the Greek currency and relative improvement of the economic situation in Greece, although things were far from normal. The food situation had improved thanks to the easing of the Axis reparations and the international relief efforts. And the famine of 1941-42 wasn't repeated, at least not at the same levels. By 1944, the cities had got their ration system in order, largely because of the Red Cross, which focused on the Athens area. But the villages and towns were now malnourished, or in some cases, still starving. 
It should hardly surprise anyone to learn that a Greek resistance sprang up and a state of civil war existed in the country starting from 1943. Italy had also capitulated in 1943 with the Germans moving into the Italian zone. The Italian Acqui division on the island of Kefalonia was massacred by the Germans, with 9,406 out of 11,700 total Italians being executed and their bodies burned. The other 1,200 had escaped and were found by the British in November 1944. This event was captured in the novel of Captain Corelli's Mandolin and the film which I saw the set for when I visited the island a few years back. And there was a tale told to me and my family when we visited the island of Kalimnos in the 1990s, although I cannot verify this with the other sources I have. Apparently the new German garrison told the local fishermen of one town to go out into the bay to fish. Then they used them for target practice. Could be false, but the locals believe the story, so if you're German, I wouldn't recommend going to that particular island. But anyway, the situation for the Greeks hadn't exactly improved by much, thanks to the German change of heart. In many instances, the Huns executed the entirety of the male population of towns, as they did in Cavalarita, where they executed all men and teenagers from the age of 15 and up in one afternoon, a total of 1,418 deaths in the space of half an hour. The Di Stomo massacre bears testament to the fact that the Germans had no inhibitions in murdering even women and infants. In Di Stomo, they assassinated 20 infants, 45 children, 111 adults and 42 elders in a short amount of time. During the Axis occupation, the Bulgarians also slaughtered in mass, like in the abominable slaughter in Dramas where 7,000 were mass slain, a total of 30,000 civilians. The price of a loaf of bread had gone from 10 drachmas in early 1941 to 153 million drachmas by September 1944. By the end of the war, 1.2 million people, 18% of the Greek population, were homeless. 15,000 shop owners and business owners had lost their business facilities, with another 80,000 families forced to sell their homes, and 5,000 schools were destroyed. No matter which way you look at it, the Axis occupation of Greece was a catastrophe. And it's no wonder their national motto is freedom or death. If you'd like to hear more about the Axis food crisis in the Second World War, check out my video on Goebbels and the German food crisis. You may want to hear about the fate of Soviet prisoners of war in German hands, and also my video The Real Reason Why Hitler Had to Start World War II will explain why the food crisis started Hitler on the path to war in the first place. Thanks for watching, bye for now.